Hi there, class. Um, welcome to this week's lecture. This is uh, about chapter 15. Let's jump right in. Starting with our quote of the week, this is Gary Vaynerchuk. You have to understand your own personal DNA. Don't do things because I do them or Steve Jobs or Mark Cuban tried it. You need to know your personal brand and stay true to it. Um, point here being that uh, you got to find your own way and not just copy the greats. doesn't mean you can't learn from them. Um, here's the cliff notes for this week's lecture. This week we're going to talk about marketing channels. Um, effectively what we're talking about here is channels of distribution. So there are questions about how do we get our product um, from here to there in a marketing place. Ultimately we need the product to land where the customer is. And so there's a lot of of potential ways that we can get the product from here to there. This, um, this is on the heels of B2C and B2B because um, partnerships and what, what is commonly called business development is all about developing partnership relationships that, um, that affect the and support distribution channels. So with that, that uh, said, let's jump right in. So the question is, um, are there parts of the market that are too hard for us to reach. They're not convenient, they're not close to where our manufacturer is, there, um, there may be other barriers that we have to overcome, but, the, um, but they, do, they are a market where people would want and purchase our product. Um, an example, this is, uh, I don't know how many of you have done the drive down to St. George and, and as you get uh, almost to Washington you can see the big uh, Walmart distribution center. Um, well, a DC is a common component in, um, in distribution. Walmart owns their whole distribution network. So from uh, they, they bring in goods from the individual manufacturers and then they uh, send them to a distribution center and then send them out to the stores. That's not always the way it works. Sometimes there's a, there are a number of players who um, who are in the supply chain from manufacturer to customer. And um, one of the big questions you have is who takes ownership of the goods and what does that do to your ability to control uh, the price, uh, the brand, and the key elements um, of what's relevant to, uh, to the consumer. So an example of this might be... Um, uh, well, ownership is a key component of this. An example might be that you have a distributor in a foreign country and they take full ownership. Now the advantage of that is that by taking full ownership they take full risk. If for some reason they don't sell all the, the all of the product, that's uh, their problem, not yours. Um, another scenario might, the, the, the downside to that uh, is that they also have full control. They could say, hey, well, look, we're going to do whatever it takes to sell this stuff. They could undercut your pricing. They could, um, uh, they could do whatever it takes in their in that's in their interest, maybe not yours. Um, so the, there's a lot of players at work in, in the supply chain of how uh, a product is distributed from manufacturer to consumer. Um, and the relationships at every step along the way um, have to be negotiated. So you've got producers, middlemen, and consumers, and we'll talk about uh, about each of these. Uh, channel distribution structures can be super simple, like maybe like manufacturer, direct to consumer, or direct to retailer, um, or they might be really complex. And the complex model here I've got overlaid over the map of Japan because we, in the text, uh, we'll use Japan as the example of a hyper complex. Uh, distribution system. Um, and most systems fall somewhere in between, somewhere in between the super simple and the complex. The On the simple side, you have what's called an import-oriented distribution. So this is really common in traditional societies, underdeveloped economies, um, very straightforward. You don't have a lot of layers. There's not a lot of middlemen. Um, pretty much somebody, uh, there's a producer, and there's somebody who imports the, those products and gets them to consumers. When you have an import-oriented uh, uh, setup, that importer controls a fixed supply of merchandise. So what does that do? Well, basic economics is telling us that, that if there is limited supply, if, and assuming that that supply is less than demand, then um, you're going to have high-priced goods. And in fact, that's the case. Um, in an import-oriented setup, you have 
limited supply that's sold at high prices to a small number of affluent consu consumers. So you only need a small number of consumers as long as they can afford to pay the high price. Now, when we're talking about um, distribution, there's two, two approaches, right? We can either have low price where we're going for penetration, or we have high price where we're, we're using what's called a skimming strategy, which means we're trying to ex extract the, the greatest amount of margin um, from a smaller number of transactions. Well, in this case, with import uh, orientation, the, um, you're, not trying, you're not going for penetration because there's a limited supply. You can only manage so much, uh, so much of the product. And so the infrastructure for big penetration and mass distribution aren't required. Um, you already have... Uh, uh, this is looks like incorrect. Really, uh, you have demand that is greater than supply, so you're already selling everything that you have. You don't have a need to try to reach greater uh, a greater number of customers. Um, the other thing is, let's say you have new entrants into the market. Well, um, you've already established yourself in uh, in the import oriented culture, and you're the you're the go to person for this particular good or service, and so customers get trained. They know where to look uh, for this product, and new entrants would have to try to change that behavior, um, which is, is difficult and a barrier to entry. One of the things about import-oriented is that they, they, are not, um, they don't have great reach. If they did, they would start to function more like a mass channel instead of, of localized. So what happens is they the import-oriented structures exist in small, uh, small microeconomic uh, regions. Uh, so you're local rather than uh, national. In addition to the product itself, the importer uh, typically provides any value-added services that go along with the product. So in a, in a mass system, you may have all kinds of middlemen in there that provide various services. But where when the channel is um, is a single source, then they typically also provide all the service. Now, um, take a look at, at Japan. Uh, the thing about Japan is you have a traditional, uh, there's a, a, a tradition of many layers in the society participating in the distribution system. And they're, as a result, and each of those layers, it's symbiotic. They support each other. They believe that, that all of those layers have a right to exist. Um, at the, at the uh, customer side, at the bottom end of, of the structure, you may have as many, you know, just as one small retail store. Uh, up from there may be a distribution center that covers a, a, you know, se several neighborhoods. And the layers continue to, uh, to develop. And everybody feels like that, that they each get a little cut and that's fair, and that helps it. Uh, it's a system that helps everybody, you know, earn a living, and it's a very, um, uh, it, it, it's not, uh, it's collectivist. It's not individuals. So everybody is is doing their part to help everybody else get get along and make a living. Now, why is this a uh, a huge barrier to entry? Because if you try to disrupt anything in the in this type of a distribution system. There's a there's both a culture well there is a cultural bias against disruption. They're like you know, if you're rocking the boat, this uh, you're going to have a bias against you. Um, uh, as a result of that, you've got all of these little middlemen, and they're they're you don't have now even in Japan this is starting to change. But the traditional structure is that you that you don't have any gigantic. Um, source on the consumer end. Uh, so you're pushing down to a lot of small uh, small middlemen who push down to a bunch of small retailers. And as a result of that, nobody in the system has very much power um, except for the manufacturer. So the manufacturer has all the control. They're providing the goods that, that feed the whole system. There is a, a number of other things that, that um, the manufacturer has in their advantage to, to keep control of the system. And you'll know this is the exact opposite of what we have in the United States. In the United States, the closer you are to the consumer, the more control you have over the system. Because the consumer ultimately pays, the consumer has lots of choice. Um, closer you are to the consumer, the more control you have. In this system, it's the further away from the consumer you are, the more control you have. Because nobody controls very many consumers. 
a um, couple of ways that, that the manufacturer can, can control distribution partners. One is they can finance the inventory. They're big enough, they could say, well, hey, we'll, we, uh, we won't require you to pay this inventory, uh, to pay for this inventory. You can have it and put it on your shelf. We'll give you credit, and, um, and that way you don't have to come up with the cash or go through the economic risk of acquiring the inventory. We could, we could combine rebates. So since we're providing uh, you, all, of your, all of your products, you can combine rebates on several different products and get a better deal. Um, if there's a single source for one product, you don't have any ability to combine across products. Um, we also can uh, assuage the inventory risk by allowing returns. Um, this is a, like a consignment process. You take the goods, you sell what you can, what you don't, uh, what you don't sell, you send back, and uh, you're not at risk for them. This is the exact opposite of what we have in, a, in what's called a guaranteed sales scenario. A uh, quick story. When I was doing the marketing for uh, uh, the retail division of ProvoCraft, we, uh, I was there when the parent company, when ProvoCraft was first, um, first taking its Cricut paper cutters into Walmart. And Walmart's, Walmart's structure was a guaranteed sale. And uh, the, the folks at ProvoCraft weren't very familiar with that um, when that deal was done. So what, they, what the guaranteed sale means is Walmart says, okay, you can, you can put your products uh, on our shelves and uh, but anything that we don't sell, we send back to you, and you have to, uh, you have to re um, give us a refund. So what that means is Walmart has zero inventory risk in that scenario. The that Provocraft took it all. Well, in this case, the merchant may or the the manufacturer may step into that role voluntarily because he knows the retailer doesn't have uh, doesn't have the financial capa capacity to to take that inventory risk, and that makes the the retailer more dependent on the manufacturer. The other thing is promotional support. So you may see uh, a POP display as a point of purchase display like uh, you know when a new movie comes out you go into Walmart and you see that there's a big cardboard um, promotion that, that has the characters from the movie on it and those things are, are often uh, created by the manufacturer of the goods and these can they don't have to be big floor displays they can be um, you know, little images or, uh, or cardboard cutouts that, that go on the shelf. They could be little uh, shelf flags, um, anything that helps drive uh, the kind of emotional purchase. Um, and by producing those at the manufacturing level, you get the economy of scale of producing them for all of your distributors and retailers. Um, the structure in Japan is um, is tied into the to the collectivist culture. Their whole business philosophy about who deserves to make them to make money and how much is driven by um, their deep collectivist culture. And as a result, the legal system um, also is designed to su to support that. So, uh, if you come in with something disruptive, like you come in with a big box retailer that that isn't really that's designed to to absorb economies of scale and not designed to have all of these layers in the distribution system where you're going to have to fight not only the cultural bias against you but you may have to fight the regulatory environment that is designed to um, to protect these, uh, uh, these this many layered system. Um, here's a quick look at different types of uh, sorry if you hear that uh, siren in the background I'm actually at a conference in New Orleans today so uh, forgive me that I don't have more a more quiet environment. Um, I don't think they're coming for me. Take a look at these highlighted items. So health and beauty, right? In Germany, you've got a, you know a higher percentage of uh, sales in health and beauty products than in Japan or the U.S. And think about you know, why might that be? Uh, what about home and garden? Look at Japan. Well, if you if all of your housing is uh, high rises or small footprint apartments, um, you're not going to have a lot of need for. Uh, you know, riding tractors and, and uh, you know, lawnmowers and things like that. Um, also, look at, uh, at under mixed use. So the, the old school approach to retail has uh, many specialized retailers that, that are narrow in what they provide. You don't have these supermarkets like a, uh, like a, a Walmart or, um, or Target where you, have, you can buy a hammer and shampoo and your food. Um, in, so in Germany, that, 
that structure is more intact than it is in either Japan or the U.S. Um, direct sales. So direct sales is kind of a euphemism for network marketing, and this is a relationship-based distribution channel. It's um, you know we we experience that probably more in Utah than just about any other place in the United States. And if you look at the companies that are um, long in the tooth in Utah in network marketing, the the, uh, the new skins and and whatnot, and uh, Nature Sunshine and Herbalife, these guys that have been around a long time, where are they drawing a lot of their revenues now? A lot of those are coming in Asia, where this relationship-based sale is a much um, more acceptable cultural fit than it is. Um, in the U.S., even if, if that's where those companies were started, or in, in in Europe. And then the last one is look at vending machines. Japan, as vending machines as a distribution channel, is way bigger in Japan than it is in either the U.S. or Germany. Um, okay. Now, just because they're, um, just because this is the way that it has been, doesn't mean that that this isn't something that is shifting. So even though Japan has this uh, very traditional multi-layered system, the trend is for complex distribution systems to modernize into more simple, not necessarily import-oriented, but just streamlined uh, distribution systems. And I mean, this is this is what you would expect, right? As as people are being imaginative about how they um, how they trim extra cost out of the supply chain and how they get their goods to market. Um, as well as being supported by technology, you see this. So um, direct marketing, door-to-door -door selling, these things are, are entering markets. Um, supermarkets, uh, discount importers, malls and catalogs, and then of course um, e-tailers online. Um, all of those are changing attitudes and, um, and acceptable methods for distributing your product from producer to consumer. Um, another component of this is that uh, players in the supply chain are getting more involved in the products. So you may have uh, somebody who traditionally they're a distributor. They bring in manufactured goods, pass them on to retailers. Well, they may have enough influence and enough knowledge about what's happening for consumers that they want to get in uh, and be involved in product development themselves. Um, and you know the the important thing to know as marketers today is that even though this is changing, and there's a trend that is changing. It's not going to happen immediately. It's going to take time for new patterns to replace the old. Um, almost all international firms have been forced by the structure of the market to use some middlemen in the distribution arrangement. So there are very few that have the, the power and reach and cultural understanding to go directly from manufacturer to consumer. Um, there's almost always some, some type of distribution in the middle. Um, sometimes it can be tempting because we call one, you know, one thing a distributor in the U.S., another thing a distributor in India, um, and it seems like that those, uh, those words all mean the same thing, but that doesn't mean that the process by which they operate is, uh, is identical or even similar. Um, and you see that retail mimics real life. So as we've talked about all of the uh, all of the cultural attitudes, differences, uh, approaches to how we buy and sell goods, those are, are evidence in our retail patterns. And so at all levels of the distribution process, you have the potential for a cultural element to come in and, and create um, dissonance between one country or one market and another. Uh, and this is, so if you think of wholesaling as higher in the distribution process, and retailing as the bottom of the distribution process, the diversity increases the, fur the closer you get to the consumer. And so as a result, retailing has greater diversity uh, than wholesaling. And we're talking structural diversity. This is um, how does the product get into the hands of the consumer? Do I go into a store? Does somebody bring it to me? Do I, uh, you know, this, uh, this would be something like, um, you know, do I uh, call a delivery person for my takeout? Do I use Uber Eats? Do I go to a vending machine? Do I go to a shopping mall or a food court? Uh, or do I go to a butcher's? Um, all of these, this variety increases the closer we get to the consumer. So um, if you're a manufacturer, you can sell to uh, large dominant retailers and that's easy. There are catalog, even if you want to sell to like uh, convenience stores, if they're chains, 
there are convenience store catalogs. And so you go to the, the, um, the, the key distribution channel and you can sell into that and it's kind of a one-stop uh, one deal. But um, there's not the same uh, method to reach you know, a, a wide variety of small mom and pop retailers. Um, and altogether, those little small, those little mom and pops uh, generate a lot of sales. Now, the the rate of change in terms of the pattern of moving from um, uh, of moving from more traditional complex distribution systems to streamlined modern distribution systems is tied into the stage and speed of economic development of the country and the market where uh, where you are. Let me skip over this one. So uh, we talked about a little bit about direct marketing, network marketing, um, selling person to person, or it could be uh, telemarketing, which exists in some places still. The U.S. has you know has pretty much driven telemarketing out of business unless you're doing uh, either surveys or politics. Um, and in uh, in underdeveloped countries, they may have a more uh, more cultural acceptance for for like a door-to-door -door salesperson for a person-to-person -person, uh, sale uh, because that's that's more common to what they've done. They're, they're not used to as much technology assistance um, as, uh, as a more developed market. Now this is this is also what happens. This trend, right, moving from traditional to modern in terms of distribution centers can seem really threatening to somebody who's steeped in the in the traditional method. And why is that? Well, we're talking about changes to the way that money flows through the system. So when we change how money flows through the system, that means we're changing how people get their livelihoods, we're changing the fortunes of the players. And so what if I get left behind? Well, if I get left behind, it means that I'm out in terms of being able to, to earn a living. And so that feels threatening. Looking at uh, percentage of sales by type of retailer. So check this out. Um, if we look at the number of people served per retail store, so in other words, what's the reach of each retail store? In the United States, we've got lots of retailers and lots of people served by each one. Compare that with China, right? China has way more retailers than the United States and still has a lot served uh, for each one. So you're not quite as much as the United States, but still quite a bit. Now look at one that, that doesn't serve, look at Argentina half as many retailers as the US for a country that is much smaller um, and but each retailer only serves you know less than a hundred people so um, we call this like a like the um, cannibalization radius so when I did the marketing for uh, the Robert stores at Provocraft we we anticipated about a three mile uh, cannibalization radius which meant uh, if the stores were any closer together than three miles then, then a three mile radius, so effectively six miles, then that meant that one store was starting to uh, siphon off sales that would have gone to another, and they would, and the overall store sales would, would feel a hit. Um, and you see this as you go, as you increase in size. I was, um, I was close with the managers of the Walmart in Springville when the Walmart in Payson was, was built. And there, there was a lot of grumbling and complaining because Payson was close enough that it started to siphon off the sales. And you're talking about the situation there where you're probably less than 10 miles. Um, another interesting thing was when the, um, you know, and some retailers can, can uh, support a really tight radius, and some of the radius is really large. Uh, an example of a really large one is Cabela's. So when the Cabela's was built in Salt Lake City, uh, you know, in Lehigh, Port of the Mountain, the um, the home Cabela's, which the next closest Cabela's was in North Dakota, where they're based, and they they felt an impact in their sales in North Dakota from the the store that was in uh, that was in Lehigh. So you, and Cabela's are talking about a gigantic um, cannibalization radius. So and when we talk about the channel, we're talking about everything that that can happen from soup to nuts, start to being start to finish between the manufacturer and the final consumer. Um, now, when you're first starting a company, you have multiple channels to choose from, right? Like maybe my product is best suited to vending machines, maybe convenience stores, maybe it's well suited to direct marketing. 
one of the things uh, that you just need to be aware of is that after you start, it's, it's very difficult to change your distribution channel. We talked about how in most cases there's you're going to have some middlemen that it's really hard to own the whole distribution channel. But if you think about the spectrum as running from the entire distribution channel, um, even creating your own channel, um, to depending on intermediaries, somewhere in that spectrum uh, is your distribution channel choice is going to fall. Um, here's a model that shows you what some of the options might be. So let's say that you are you make your product uh, in the domestic market, and you could sell directly to foreign consumers. You could um, sell to a domestic uh, middleman who gets it to an exporter, who gets it to an importer, who gets it to another middleman who finally gets it to the foreign retailer. You could hire a company to do part of this work for you to get uh, your product from manufacturer to either an exporter or across to an importer or to a foreign uh, merchant or to a foreign retailer and any combination of these is possible. Let's talk about what some of these look like. Um, home country middlemen. So you've got, you're going to get, to, uh, take your product from manufacturer to some type of home country middleman, a distributor of some type who is going to provide services in getting your product um, from, they, they work in the, in the domestic market and, and find a way to get your product into foreign markets. Here's some uh, typical intermediaries. Retail stores, retailers, export management companies, trading companies, um, spe uh, specialized export trading companies, um, marketers who are doing complementary products, um, an export agent, brokers, companies that focus just on buying, companies that focus just on selling, and so forth. Now, what, what's the, uh, what does the picture look like if you focus on foreign middlemen? So, you, in the foreign markets, you have similar options to what you have in the home market. It allows you to um, deal directly with people in the foreign market, which might give you the control that, that, uh, that you need. You, um, you may cut out middlemen in the home country, which, which tightens up the channel and gives you more direct influence on the market. Um, it takes you closer to the market right, by removing steps, uh, and it also puts you in closer contact with language issues, distribution issues, and finance issues in the target market. Um, and the foreign middlemen may be uh, they may be independents, or they might uh, be employees or uh, contractors for the parent company. The relationship can be uh, any you know, can span the gamut, um, and, or they could be temps. The people that you hire for a specific job. When you um, you guys did the uh, write up on uh, the uh, what is it the seven uh, distribution article, and um, in there you know you saw this, this issue where okay we we hire distributors and then all of a sudden we find out wait wait a minute the distributor isn't necessarily loyal to us that they're also distributing our competitors' product that they might they might uh, find that it makes sense for them to go into business themselves and become a competitor they might drop us. Um, there's there is a lot of complication uh, in selecting the right uh, middleman, and well, this is this is self-explanatory. Now, uh, what happens if you're dealing with the government? So you're always going to have to deal with the government in some sense, in that your products are going to have to be uh, your products are probably regulated. Their labeling is probably regulated. You're going to have to deal with that with importers and import. Uh, customs officials, uh, etc. There, um, that only increases if you're actually selling a product or service that is consumed by the government. So if the government's like, look, we're incentivized to increase our um, uh, our economic development, and so we're going to start buying products. And if you're selling directly to the government, that just increases the involvement, um, and and it may increase the duration of the sales cycle. It may increase the amount of paperwork that you have to do to complete the sale. Um, and then in, in, um, in some countries, you see this a ton. The, the Netherlands is a, an example from the text that, uh, that the government buys from a lot of different suppliers. And then, uh, then you, may be, you may have places where the government has preferred suppliers, and you just have to get on that list. And that's, that's the way to, to uh, penetrate the foreign market. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about how to pick.
you know, now that we've we've laid out, there's lots of different channels, lots of different um, approaches you could use. How do you tell which one is the right one? Well, to start with, we want to identify clearly what our what the target market is. So if we're going into India, for example, who in India is our target buyer and how many of those people are there and where are they located? When we Then we go to number two. What are our goals in that market? So we, we've defined it. Now how much, uh, what are our goals in terms of our ability to impact it? Um, are we going to sell a certain number of, of units? Are we going to capture a certain amount of market share? Do we anticipate that entering that market will um, yield sales at a certain profit margin? All of those things are critical for us to understand. And then number three, okay, that's what we're shooting for, but it's going to take a certain amount of money. We're going to have to invest in order to make this happen. What kind of financial and personnel commitments are we willing to make in order to try to capture the, the share that we identified to, to accomplish the goals we identified in step two? And then uh, number four, finally, we need to decide um, who's going to control what part of this supply chain. And who's going to own what and where, what are the agreements and relationships and everything that need to be in place. So let's look at each of these just a little bit closer. This, um, I forget the, I forget the guy who, who came up with the six C's, but this is a great framework for um, considering all the issues in your, uh, in your channel. What is it going to cost to continue, uh, to, to set up the channel and to continue developing and maintaining your channel? How much capital are you going to have to invest in order to enter the market and then to maintain a presence in the market? When it comes to control, how much control are you going to give up? At what stages? Um, where are you going to, uh, who are you going to trust to do what? Who are you going to contract with to do what? Um, how much of the market do you need to cover? Um, or can you, will you be happy covering only a small targeted segment? Um, the character, this is a very interesting one. Does the channel and the, the players in the, in the distribution system, do they match the character of the business? Um, and the reason this is important is because to the extent that they don't, your brand will be watered down. The character that you present will be watered down uh, by the time it reaches the consumer. So you've got to decide. If you, pick, uh, if you pick partners that have similar values and goals, then it's likely that you'll be able to maintain the character of your brand throughout, throughout the supply chain. But sometimes th that can be a really complex, really complex question. And then continu continuity. This goes back to the article. Um, where is there a chance that you might pick a distribution partner, you might, you might set somebody up in your supply chain that ultimately isn't going to last. They're going to they're gonna flake out or go away or, or outgrow you. So uh, a lot of companies have tried to develop this system but have been unable to build a satisfactory channel. Uh, and it, that stops them in their tracks. They make sure they just can't do it. In fact, just last year, we saw McDonald's essentially sell off all of their Chinese, uh, Chinese stores to a company in China to run. So they still carry the name of McDonald's, but it's only a licensing agreement. Um, the McDonald's mothership no longer owns the, the McDonald's in China. How come? McDonald's is a huge company. They've got all kinds of resources. They've got all kinds of marketing skills and know-how. It uh, wasn't enough. They didn't have enough to, uh, to tackle the cultural challenges and everything else that were required in order to have and maintain a presence in China. And so their best, uh, financially, their best move was to give it up. Um, building your network of middlemen, building your supply chain, means that you have to find where middlemen should be inserted. And if you can't find the people who fit your requirements, you are, you know, what do you do? You can either try to raise somebody up, you can try to train somebody into it, but you're not going to have the advantage of just going out and, uh, and having, you know, hiring the right people or negotiating with the right people and having everything work. Um, your commitment and your, your commitment to both re financial resources and personnel skyrockets as soon as you can't fill uh, one of the roles in your supply chain. Um, and then ultimately, the closer that the company wants to get to the consumer, um, the larger sales force is required. So you need a home-based direct sales force in order to really be tightly, um, uh, tightly attached to the, the buyer's journey and the consumer's experience with your product. Um, and, and when you 
gain the efficiencies of more middlemen and, and step back from having a sales force that's, that is uh, right there with the consumer, what you give up is a closeness and an understanding of the consumer that, that uh, you otherwise might have. So to build this out, got to find middlemen, got to choose middlemen, got to properly motivate and compensate middlemen, got to figure out what to do if you have to terminate middlemen, how do you, how do you release them, what are your contracts and obligations with them, and then how to control them how to make sure that they're performing in a way that, um, that supports your brand. Here's a set of criteria that's, that's uh, common. What's their reputation? Have they done this before? Um, are, do they have a reputation for being honest? Do they have a reputation for getting the job done? Um, are they creditworthy? Sometimes just by taking a look at their ability, um, at their financial assets and their, their ability to borrow, you can see if they're um, worthy to if they're credit worthy to take on the risk associated with um, moving your product through their part of the supply chain. What markets do they serve? Are they are they aligned with the market you're trying to enter or are they just uh, analogous and think well that's it can't be that different so I'm going to go ahead and help take this product to an adjacent market. Do they already carry certain products and do those products compete or are they complementary to yours? Um, in what ways are they similar? In what ways are they different? How many stores do they serve? How big are the stores, and is that similar to what uh, what you want in terms of your chain? The um, and then the agreement that put, pulls all of these things together um, ha is going to have a whole bunch of terms, and you need to make sure that those terms are acceptable. Now, what does the internet do to all this? Well. For one, e-commerce is a growing method of distribution. We talked about how if I want to ship internationally, I actually can do that. You know, I don't. I can have um, my merchant, my my Visa card can handle foreign exchanges. My um, I can ship through Amazon. The the post office will make sure that my stuff gets there, or FedEx or UPS. And so I can actually mount an international operation relatively easy, easily from within the United States because of e-commerce. So that that's disruptive. Um, now, when I use the internet to distribute products, what do I need to worry about? Well, culture is is um, my product descriptions and the, and uh, the product itself are they do they fit uh, within the culture that I'm targeting? Do I need to adapt? Do I need to have my um, my labels or my product descriptions uh, to be in the target language? Do I need somebody local to to a contact? What if there's customer support issues? What if there's a return? Um, how do I deal with that? Uh, how do I take payment? Do what if I'm selling online, but I'm selling to India, and I and people have credit cards but don't use them? You know, what am I going to do? Do I uh, do I take payment by MoneyGram? Do I take payment some other way? How does my product get there? What if the post office doesn't go there? What if DHL doesn't go there? And then promotion. If uh, uh, is there any way that I can encourage the sale of my uh, e-commerce product in the foreign market with uh, without addressing all of these things, making uh, advertising that's cultural, culturally appropriate in the target market's language, etc. Here's a quick, um, this is a quick case study on does it make sense to uh, to create a gray market? In other words, does it, does it make sense for me to sell directly into a foreign market? Um, here's the example. I'm selling uh, Native American turquoise jewelry and the uh, orders for this jewelry range from $200 to $800. The shipping on the orders is $52 to $58 per order. In France, the customers will pay 15 to 20% more than they do in the U.S. Question, is it worth it? Is it worth it for me to engage in selling these products? Well, let's do a little bit of math, right? Let's say that, that uh, we have a pretty big range here. Let's say if we, what's, what's the, uh, if we split the difference between 200 and 800, um, that's uh, what, uh, 500, right? So 300 more, 300 less, so 500. And so shipping is working out to be around 10%, maybe just up, uh, just above 10%, uh, maybe 11% per order. Well, if shipping is only 11% and the average French customer pays 15 to 20%, we split the difference to say 18%, um, then I, I can still clear an extra 8%. The shipping doesn't cost me more than it takes to sell my goods into the French consumers. Okay, that'll do it for this week. We will see you next week. Okay, that'll do it for this week. We'll see you next week.
Thank you.